Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, a discussion of foreign affairs with former ambassador to NATO, Kurt Volker. And we'll hear about why the Valley is host to so many mega sporting events. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. Arizona Senator John McCain lashed out at protesters at a Senate hearing on global challenges today. The demonstrators disrupted the start of the hearing by calling for former Secretary of State Henry Kissinger to be arrested for war crimes. McCain threatened to have the protesters arrested and then told them, quote, get out of here, you lowlife scum. McCain's remark was met with a smattering of applause. New elections in Greece signal concern for the EU and pro-Russian rebels are on the attack again in eastern Ukraine. Here to discuss these and other world events is former ambassador to NATO Kurt Volker, who also serves as director of ASU's McCain Institute and joins us on a monthly basis, which we always look forward to. Good to see you again. Great to be here. Today. It's, it's, we got so much to talk about. I mean, there world is a mess. No, <laughs> uh, yes, it kind of yeah. let's start with elections in Greece, because I find this fascinating. This sounds like austerity uh, took a hit at the polls, huh? It did, it did. That you've had such unemployment in Greece for so long, people are so tired of it. The popular mood is that they don't even have an independent government. They've been controlled by Germany for the last few years, which has dictated these economic policies in order to keep the bailouts going. And the people basically got fed up, voted in a very left-wing uh, party, Syriza, which has vowed to take it to the EU and uh, reduce austerity, and, and you know that's where they're headed now. It sounds as though this, this uh, left-wing party, though, kind of has a coalition going with a right-wing group as well? They share this antipathy toward Germany and toward being told what to do about the Eurozone, so that's one piece of it. Um, they feel that Typical political parties in Greece, New Democracy, the conservative one, or PASOK, the socialist one, have let them down over the years. So there's been a flight of the voters to these extreme parties. And I have to say, you don't see this only in Greece. You see it in Spain, where the Podemos party is on the rise there. That's another far-left party similar to Syriza. In France, you've got Jean, uh, uh, Marine Le Pen of the far-right political party. And, and, and as far as Greece is concerned, though, it's, I know they want to renegotiate these yeah. bailouts, and this is the deal, and I'm sure Spain would like to do the... Uh, they uh, would. They, how, how far does this go? What does this mean for the EU? What does it mean for Germany? Well, the, the, the giant risk here for Europe is that they can't come to terms between the rest of the EU and Greece, because if Greece splits off from the Eurozone, um, then it's going to shake the, the confidence that the Eurozone holds together with everybody else, because you have all of these other similar problems elsewhere. At the same time, uh, the Germans don't want to set a precedent that after all this effort at austerity and controlling expenditures, then you just have this multi-hundred billion dollar bailout, as it were, or writing down all the Euro debt. That's also going to be destructive. And if Greece gets away with it, then the Spanish or others will say, well, why not me? If Greece gets away with it, though, what does what international creditors are going to come in and say, I nope. like the way you do business? Yeah, well, if they stay in the Eurozone and they get bailed out by Germany and they hold the integrity of the Euro, that's actually confidence for investors that, okay, they're willing to do whatever it takes. On the other hand, if the Greeks break with the austerity policies, refuse to come to terms with Germany over anything that Germany could live with, bust out of the Eurozone, they devalue the currency, they aren't going to be very attractive to uh, lenders internationally. At the same time, they're going to feel that now we have control again. Now we can devalue our currency. Now we can set our own policies. We don't have to be driven by what's happening elsewhere. I think it's a fantasy. It's not reality. Uh, the economies are linked no matter what. But that's that popular mood in Greece that has driven this. Uh, why hasn't austerity worked over there? I mean, it, it seems like it just isn't working. <clears throat> austerity is one piece of it. That's cutting your government expenditures or raising taxes. But you need economic restructuring at the same time. The markets in some of these countries are so rigid. It's so hard to hire people. The employer taxes are so high. Labor mobility is so low. Uh, there's no easy way, uh, with all the regulation they've got, for economies to adjust. 
Uh, so, you know, they haven't had the restructuring necessary to benefit from the kind of austerity that they've had. As far as the, the EU in general, I know you, you're saying that they're really watching this. They don't want this to be a precedent. But just in general, is, uh, is the EU threat? How much is the EU threat? Um, more than we might think. Uh, certainly, start with the Eurozone, okay? So the EU is more than just a Euro project. It's also political and economic and the integration of Europe as a whole. But the Euro has become symbolic of whether Europe is succeeding or failing. And if the Eurozone starts to come apart because of Greece or because of Spain or a combination of things, it really does shake Europe. We've already seen, as we talked about, the rise of some of these more extreme parties, uh, UKIP in the UK, Alliance for Deutschland in Germany, uh, people who really oppose the idea of further integration in the EU. Uh, that could really take a hold after a uh, breakup of the Eurozone. And you mentioned uh, in France as well this Marine Le Pen, who yeah. now seems to be the front runner as far as the president's concerned, and she is, uh, national front parties are usually pretty far right wing. And she is. Yeah, she is. talk to us about her. Yeah, well, you have to again think about France. Where are they? Massive deficits, a uh, government that is widely seen as incompetent, but President Hollande has the lowest popularity rating of any post-war president in France. Uh, you have immigration issues, which people have been chafing at over a long time, uh, several million Muslim immigrants from North Africa. That is seen in public eyes connected now to these terrorist attacks, the, the uh, Charlie Hebdo bombings, which were conducted by Islamist terrorists inside uh, Paris. So the public is conflating these things and saying we need to have a much more nationalist, a much more self-protective direction for France, and that plays right into Marine Le Pen's political platform. Could she possibly be the next it's president? It's possible. It's possible. Uh, what ha what's going to happen in France now is you're going to have a runoff uh, in the presidential election. So you'll have multiple candidates to start, and you're going to then be down to two. And then it's a question of how whichever candidate is up against her fares with the opposing political party's voters. Right. Let's assume that it's the conservative, Sarkozy, who is up against Marine Le Pen. He needs socialist voters to come over to his side to defeat her. You need coalitions then, yeah. in other words. Yeah. And, and now, as far as the economic situation over there, and, and you kind of touched on this, but it, again, you know, you look through history, you look at the World War II, and you look at the, the in, in between eras, and bad economies you often see national yeah. front parties right. and, and conservative fascist parties. Mm -hmm. Are we seeing a little bit of that? We are. We are. We haven't seen the extremes that you would say you saw in the 1930s coming out of Western Europe or Central Europe yet. Uh, but you do have political parties in many countries uh, that are on the far right that are larger than they have been certainly in my lifetime. So you're talking, they used to be fringe, 5 8 percent. You're talking 20 25 percent now. And as far as immigration, you mentioned immigration and, and uh, uh, Islam in France. That's something that's not going to go away anytime soon, especially after these attacks. Uh, no, it's not. The, the pivot on this is whether the Muslim communities in these countries themselves distance from the extremists and the terrorists, or whether they are seen as equally fed up with the host European society. In the case of France, what's shocking is everyone came out with these buttons that saying, you know, je suis Charlie, I am, I am Charlie. Uh, Muslim communities in France objected to this because they still didn't like those cartoon covers that came out afterwards uh, with a picture of Mohammed on the cover. Uh, that doesn't sound like it's that headed for a, a good, good ending, does it? No, no. I think we've got a lot of rocky road ahead. Let's talk about, speaking of Rocky Road, let's talk about Ukraine. We always talk about yeah. Ukraine. And uh, the, the pro-Russian rebels, that peace agreement didn't last all that long with them, did no, it? No one expected it to. Uh, th there's a Russian strategy here to take territory from Ukraine, connect that to Russia. Uh, they did that with Crimea already back a year ago. They helped foment these demonstrations that led to rebellions in eastern Ukraine. And now there's a swath of territory in the middle between these things that they are trying to go after. This town that you hear in the news, Mariupol, that's the key town between Crimea, it's already taken by Russia, and eastern Ukraine where they're fighting already. So if they can connect this, it forms a land bridge all the way to Crimea. Critically important for supplying the, the naval forces that are there and supplying the population that's and, there. And there's still no question that Russia is supplying the there weapons is absolutely here. no question. Do they? No question. Okay, there's no question <laughs> regarding supplies. Is there a question of how much influence Moscow actually has on these. Are these guys renegades a little bit? Um, there are certainly some crazy people that are in this, and I think they sometimes do things that Moscow wishes they hadn't done, such as the rebel leader, when they started the attacks against Mariupol, announcing 
we are starting the attacks against Mariupol. <laughs> the Russians wanted to maintain deniability here. They said, no, right. no, the Ukrainians are doing this. It's not us. So I don't think they wanted that to happen. But in every other respect, the provision of troops, the provision of tanks, 500 tanks, 9,000 troops, 700 artillery pieces inside eastern Ukraine, not even counting Crimea. And then on the other side of the border inside Russia, you got 50,000 Russian troops there. There's no question that this was initiated and led and supplied and trained and continues to be led by Moscow. So sanctions continue against uh, Moscow. That's where well, Greece comes back. Uh, oh, God, please. <laughs> right, because the new Greek government, the Syriza government, the first day in office says, we disagree with this policy of sanctions against Russia. So whereas some in the EU were softening on Russia until the events of the last week where violence ticked up again, and they were thinking, well, maybe we should relieve some of these sanctions. Uh, others were taking a hard line, Poland, for example. Um, now the Greek government comes along and says, well, we disagree with this whole thing. We don't think we should be sanctioning Russia. Uh, they softened that today. They backed off of that a little bit. But you have to think also, you know, Russia has been funding some of these left-wing and right-wing political movements in Europe. Now they're getting a payoff in the form of a disunited Europe as they continue their military efforts in Ukraine. But are the sanctions working? We're hearing the sanctions are working. We're, obviously, the low oil prices aren't helping yeah. matters in Russia as well. We're hearing that. I mean, some are suggesting Putin could be in trouble. I kind of doubt no, that. I no, doubt. No, no. no. But are, are the sanctions doing anything? They are. They are. But, but this is the difference between our way of thinking and Putin's way of thinking. So. Price of oil is way down. Sanctions have taken a bit of a toll. The Russian economy has never been good to begin with. It needs a lot of restructuring. It's heavily dependent on extraction industries. So they've got problems. But that doesn't affect Putin's decision making. Because what props him up is this nationalist, imperialist, imperialist narrative. I'm building a great Russia. I'm retaking territory that belongs to Russia. The Russian family is coming back together. So his popularity ratings are in the 70 to 80 percent range, even while the economy is taking these hits. So uh, that's fascinating. So the Russian people, this, this idea that there's a movement and Putin may not survive, that's hogwash. It is. It is. Uh, you know, someday down the road, if the people are really suffering economically and they attach that blame to him, yes. okay, maybe then. But that isn't the case today. Today he's actually riding high and the blame is on the West and the, the positive is on the building the great Russian nation again. All right. Oh, my goodness. And before we go, <laughs> I want you to talk at least. Uh, to, we, I know we have a new a leadership change in Saudi Arabia. We got Yemen, all sorts of yeah. troubles there. We've also got Israel and Lebanon yeah. uh, going at for each other a little bit. How serious yeah. is that? Well, we saw some skirmishes this week. Uh, they did fight a war several years ago. Uh, remember, also, Hezbollah is the proxy of Iran, funded by Iran, supported by Iran. And it is the army that is doing the fighting for Assad in Syria. So I don't think that at the moment, Hezbollah really wants to be in a war with Israel. I think they've got their hands full with ISIS in Syria, and I think that they're also worried about sparking things with Israel because of the nuclear issue with Iran. I think there was a skirmish, there were a few rockets fired, the Israelis fired back. I think that will likely calm down for now. As far as Saudi Arabia and Yemen, though, that particular situation, uh, is that's that going to calm down? Uh, that's a really good one to watch because what you're seeing play out in Yemen is a fight between different factions, Shia, supported by Iran on one side, and other Sunnis, struggling over control of that country on the Arabian Peninsula. What we see with the Saudi transition is a new leadership in the Sunni part of the Middle East, and Saudi Arabia is the spiritual center of that uh, Sunni uh, religion. It's also the most powerful country economically and politically. Uh, especially now that Egypt has had so, many so mm -hmm. much trouble. So that's a repackaging on the Sunni side. During the past several years, the Shia have gotten stronger. You know, we, we toppled Saddam Hussein in Iraq, and now there's a Shia leader there. There's a Shia leader in Assad in Syria who's still hanging on to power. Uh, Hezbollah has become part of the government in Lebanon, and now we're seeing more in Yemen as well. So I think you're seeing this this rising conflict between Sunni and Shia across the Middle East. And, and again, if, if, if just anyone with a passing interest, I think that would be the first thing you look at. Which side is Shia? Which side is Sunni? Uh, how, how rising is that tide going to be? Well, know? it is. But it's, also, it's not the only thing to look at. So yes, that's right, and you need to understand where the extremes are and where the motivations are. But we can't be in the position of choosing sides, and we want the Shia to win, or we want the Sunnis to win. That's never going to work out, because that will just further inflame a sectarian conflict. 
what you have to base our own policies on is going to be values about the way societies are governed, respect for rights in societies, respect for citizenship, stability, economic development, rule of law. If you can have those things, it doesn't really matter if it's Sunni or Shia, that's going to be what creates stability over time. We've lost ground. We've lost tremendous ground on this over the past few years, but that is still where we need to try to push. And the idea, again, that it seems like a lot of the, a lot of the attention seems to be going against Sunni, whether it's ISIS or whether it's Iraq, it seems like the, uh, the uh, Shia, Sunnis got our attention while the Shias, as you yeah. say, gaining power. That's a complaint that you hear a lot from the Sunni community. Not, not the terrorists, not the extremists, right. but the, the regimes like Saudi Arabia, which are, are hardline, or others, they say, look, Every time you go after one of these terrorist groups, whether it's Al-Qaeda or whether it's ISIS or you talk about al-Nusra, uh, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, these are all Sunni terrorists. What are you doing about the Shia ones, like right. Hezbollah or uh, Hamas not being Shia but being supported by Hezbollah and Iran, uh, or the Assad regime, which has killed 200,000 of its own people? What are you doing about that? And frankly, we don't have a strong answer. All right. Well, a lot to cover there. Always great to have you here. Thank you so My much. My pleasure to be here, Ted. Thanks. The Super Bowl, the Pro Bowl, the College Football Championship, the NCAA Final Four, all big time sports events to be played or already played here in the Phoenix area. What does it take to get these major events in the Valley and what is the payoff to the region? For answers, we welcome Brad Wright, he's co-chair of the Arizona Organizing Committee, the host of the 2016 College Football National Championship. Thanks for being here, we appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Ted. The, uh, all this, uh, why? Why Phoenix? Why now? You know, I'll tell you the reason why is because we do it really, really well. Uh, I can tell you as chairman of the organizing committee, when we talk to the folks from Dallas that host the event about the reason why we were successful in our bid, they told us that we really knocked it out of the park. We met all the bid specifications. We checked all the boxes that are required to host these events. We have a fantastic stadium, uh, one of the best in the world. We have tourism infrastructure. We have light rail. We have an expanded convention center. We have communities that are willing to step in and host these events. Uh, but I think the thing that really puts us over the top is that we are a world-class destination that hosts world-class events. We have, this is where people want to come. They want to come here to games, they want to come here to vacation, and when you put that all together, it makes this really a compelling offer, uh, and I think that's why we've been so successful. And after we were awarded the bid, we created the Arizona Organizing Committee, which is a group of leaders throughout the state, business leaders, uh, sports leaders, tourism professionals, and that group is charged with hosting this event and making sure that we raise the money and that we, we uh, produce a, a really great set of events so that you know, we stay in the running for future ones. And those future ones are obviously going to look at these here and probably like what they see as far as the way things were coordinated and the way things were held. However, are we going to be able to afford some of those future ones, whether it be the NFL, the NCAA, demands for hotel rooms and demands for you know, everything from police escorts to uh, this, that, and the, can we afford, are we still going to be in the game here when you got Jerry's World in Dallas and you're going to have a new stadium probably in LA? It's a great question and I tell you, and I don't want to sound hyperbolic here, but I'm not sure we can afford not to be in the game. You know, we've invested in this infrastructure. We have a terrific stadium and we have uh, terrific infrastructure that, that allows us to host these events. And then the economic impact, it really comes back to that. The last four BCS championship games we've hosted, the precursor to the now college football championship game, generated according to the W.P. Carey uh, School of uh, Business, $646 million in economic impact. 
this game, with all its eyes on it, with the new format that we're really excited about, a Super Bowl format where it's become a, a four-day celebration of college football. We'll have four days worth of events for the football fan and the non-football fan alike, uh, a, a three-day music festival, a 5K run, um, a, a, a fan fest similar to the NFL experience. So all those events are going to drive a lot of economic activity. Uh, on top of that, on top of that direct spend from that, this is another opportunity for us to really showcase this state. And working with the governor and the Commerce Authority, right now with the Super Bowl, they're hosting, I think, 70 uh, CEOs from around the, the, the country, mm -hmm. uh, large companies that are here participating and really getting a chance to see that Arizona is a great place to do business. So our committee intends to do the exact same thing, continue telling that story about why this is a great place to, to do business and drive that economic impact. But again, and, and we had economists on last night from all stripes, and it was a good conversation. And, and I think everyone thought because of sunk cost, it, it, yes, it makes sense to, to get this done, and it's certainly not a bad thing. The Super Bowl's here. But there is a concern on return, to inve uh, return on investment. Is the ROI, is the return on investment, is it strong enough to keep going, especially when the cost and the price in the future might keep increasing? Well, I tell you, Ted, I keep going back to the economic impact and just look outside right now. You know, there's activities going on that, that wouldn't be happening but for the Super Bowl. And I know I heard, I, I watched last night and I thought it was a great conversation. And they talked about displaced uh, uh, activity. I, I, I challenge you to find that kind of activity going on right, right down the street in any other January in the Valley. And I know that's a great time for, for uh, the hotels otherwise. But, but we have lots of other activity going on that I think really drives it. As far as your group and, and getting the NCAA championship game and, and all, just, just everyone getting these things out here. And you mentioned hosting uh, business leaders and executives. That seems to, to get the people that are here to come back, to get the business leaders that are here to reconsider moving here or those that are here to stay here. How do you do that? I mean, are, are, there, are there concrete plans? Well, th there are plans, and I'll tell you, drawing from the experience we just had in Dallas, a, a contingent of our committee went down to Dallas to experience the very first game that was hosted a couple weeks ago. And I made a point of talking to uh, industry professionals and, and executives that were there about us hosting this coming January, and I asked them the question, what, what can we do to make your experience really positive? And, and they said, you've already got it. You've got the weather. You've got, it's a great place for us to go. And I, I asked them to tell me a little bit more about that. And they said, well, when we came to this event, we came solo. When we come to Phoenix, we're going to bring our families. We're going to stay a couple extra days and, and vacation either on the front end, and, end or the back end. And I think it comes back to lifestyle. And, you know, if we can further expose these folks to what we have to offer here and work in conjunction with the state, with commerce, I think we can continue to tell a compelling story that's going to drive uh, future economic development. What would you like to see? What, what are a challenge out there? What can, what can be improved as far as a coordination for getting these big games in the Valley? What, what, what can you do better? Well, there's a, there's a lot that goes into it, as you might imagine. You know, everything from making sure that you have the requisite number of hotel rooms to making sure you have the transportation plans in place. It's funny the little things that can turn these things sideways. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a lot of front-end preparation. I think the best thing we can do is, is, is pay attention to what's happening here at the Super Bowl, and by all accounts, it's coming off fantastically. Uh, paying attention to what happened in Dallas and drawing from, them, from their experiences and adopting kind of the best practices of both to make sure that our event is, is fantastic. Hey, are, there, are there folks out there that are watching, though, the requirements and the, the, the requisite uh, things that are in the contracts as far as the NCAA or the NFL? Uh, you you, you got to, I mean, they're going to ask for the sun and moon if you don't uh, kind of watch them a little bit, aren't they? Well, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's all in negotiation, and, and, and I agree, it's got to make sense at the end of the day for us. But, uh, but I'll tell you, the, the return on these things so far has proven to be, listen, uh, I, I heard Dennis Hoffman last night and, and, and Jim Rounds, and even, even Byron said, well, it's close. So, you know, I, I think there was a pretty good evidence there that these things do generate a significant amount of economic impact. Um, and, and we're excited to be a part of it. And as far as, uh, well, Byron lives out in Glendale, so I think you like the fact that they've repaved a few roads and those sorts <laughs> of things. Are you hearing that there are groups watching what's happening here so that they can take it back to their communities? There are. Um, uh, there are folks from the Dallas CFP group that are here right now, the, the, the main uh, committee, um, watching what happens. Uh, the, there are folks here from Tampa that host our, our college game in, in uh, two years. Um, so I think there's a lot of eyes on this to see what, what works. And again, we do this really well, so I think we're going to set a great example. I, I just want to make sure that we have enough to ante up. I don't want us to be uh, priced out of the game. You don't think that's going to happen? 
you know, I think we have a community that supports these events. They've embraced them. We're going to continue working with the business leaders in this state to tell that story about economic development and why it's, it makes sense to continue to invest in these. You know, we've got a great run coming up. We have the Super Bowl now, college champ game next year, and then we go Final Four. Mm -hmm. There's only one other city in history that's done that. And, and it's a wonderful platform to sh for us to showcase this state. Um, and so we're going to keep working with the communities to support. And it's not just, it's not just money that we need. Um, there's, you know, people can get involved and businesses can get involved with in-kind and with volunteers, and those are all important parts of the process. All right, well, all eyes and ears and voices certainly are on the Valley right now. I do, you can't flip on a radio without here in Phoenix, this and Scottsdale, Tempe, Glendale, that. Congratulations on getting that championship game. Thank you very much. Friday on Arizona Horizon, it's a journalist roundtable. We'll look at a move to block a voter-sponsored initiative to legalize marijuana, and we'll hear about an effort to double the length of House and Senate terms at the legislature. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thanks for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.